And I came to realize that the Germans had even hidden from themselves the evil that they were doing by altering language. They didn't use words like uh, genocide. They, uh, they didn't mm -hmm. speak in terms of mass killing. Instead, they, they uh, cloaked it uh, with phrases like, you know, the Jewish question and the final mm -hmm. solution. And I've discovered that this is the case with the World Ex Economic Forum with mm -hmm. terms like for the greater good, sustainability, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, for the good of the planet, this kind mm -hmm. of thing. And when you begin to engage them in conversation, it, this, this is the kind of language they begin to use. And if you're, mm -hmm. if you're not sort of acclimated to it, you, it might escape you what it is that they're actually talking about. And then yeah. when you realize that they say something like um, population sustainability, what they're actually talking about is, as you well know, they're, they're talking about depopulation. You know, I've spent my career taking on some of the cultural baddies, you know, some of the most prominent intellectuals in the world, some of them in public debate, some of them behind the scenes. And I've come to realize that ideas define everything that we do. With an academic degree, you're trained to be a researcher and writer to the point that it's annoying. I mean, but I'm grateful for it. I'm not talking about books I've not read. I'm not talking about papers I've not read. Whether I agree with them or not actually isn't the point. Uh, there are quite a few books that I would read that I would say are actually evil books. Donald Trump, when he was in a divorce with his first wife, she said he has a copy of Mein Kampf next to his bed. I wish more people did. If the German people had bothered to read that book rather than just have it on their shelf, we might have avoided the Holocaust. If more people read the Quran, They'd be wiser to what Islam actually is, what they actually believe. If people bothered to read, as I have, the writings of Klaus Schwab and the various contributors to the World Economic Forum and the ideas that are driving the globalists, I read them because I want to understand their mentality. I cut out the middleman. I go straight to the ideology. Everything in your life is being defined by either your ideas or the ideas of the people around you. And each episode, we're gonna be digging into a different idea that appears in the culture. This is Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. Jim, um... Uh, we both share the, the very thing that brought us together is the fact that we both share um, a deep concern, indeed, an alarm for the World Economic Forum, who they are and, uh, and what they're doing. And just by way of introduction to those who maybe aren't familiar with, you, with your work or even particularly familiar with my own, let, let me just offer just a, a very brief introduction to our viewers before I get into the weeds of that with you. The World Economic Forum was founded by Klaus Schwab, a German engineer in 1971. He is the, the founder and sole chairman of the World Economic Forum. And as I like to say, he looks like, uh, you know, Ernst Stavro Blofeld. He's, uh, you know, a bald-headed uh, a, a German who looks like a, a Bond villain. You can almost picture him, you know, petting a cat as he says, um, you will have nothing and you will be happy. I mean, this is, this is Klaus Schwab. I do think that people overestimate Klaus Schwab's particular you know, power. I mean, the World Economic Forum isn't a legislative body. They don't have the ability to impose um, legislation. They don't have an army. That said, they are a gathering place for world leaders, and um, they're, uh, they're brokers of power, and they... Uh, encourage policy, and they've been very effective at encouraging it. And so this last year at the World Economic Forum gathering in Davos, Switzerland, the one where I mentioned when I was there, there were, um, you know, over, let's see, 600 CEOs from uh, uh, various major corporations. Uh, there were 115 billionaires, and there were more than 50 heads of state, and then there were 2,700 other people, you know, like me, who were there in attendance. And these are people who are pushing, as I say, godless 
anti-human philosophy, uh, anti-human policies. Um, some of the farming policies that we're seeing, depopulation policies that we're seeing, and they're the kinds of things that, you know, only a short time ago people would say, oh, this is just conspiracy theory. This is all nonsense. No, nobody really believes that. Well, as I've demonstrated, you know, on my own podcast, I can show, you know, these are the things that they're saying publicly. They're, they're quite open about this. And as you're demonstrating, you made reference to your Twitter. Your Twitter has really exploded. You're getting a lot of traction on this issue on Twitter. And, um, and I really commend you for it. So help our audience to understand what is happening. Let's start with the UK. What is happening in the UK that got your attention, a, a farmer, a businessman in Scotland who became interested in the World Economic Forum? How did that happen? I think, um, you know, over a period of years, I've, I've been aware, I've heard the term uh, World Economic Forum before. I've heard of people meeting in a place called Davos before. I have to say, I didn't pay too much attention to it. I assumed it was sort of another one of the, the billionaire clubs for the, the, the rich and, and the industrialists, globalists, uh, those in business, banking. Um, and I suppose there are other groups that, that are very similar that you've heard about, you know, like the Bilderbergers and various others. But I, I, I really sat up and paid attention when I saw a video of the German chairman Klaus Schwab uh, bragging because he was very pleased with himself and he was actually bragging about how he and his organization had penetrated that, that those were his own words penetrated yep, the the cabinets of governments uh, around the world and it was at that point i thought you know what what is he really going on about what's this all about what does he mean when he say he's penetrated them it's important to have a Christian worldview. The question becomes, how do we build that? How do we develop that? Oftentimes we have Bible teachers who are very faithful in teaching scripture, but don't ever quite make the connection with the outside world. Other times we have Bible teachers who don't really want to touch certain topics because they're just seen to be too toxic. At tomap.com, you are going to find a wide range of issues being addressed to help you build out that Christian worldview. They're on things from, from suffering, uh, dealing with mental health, to racial reconciliation. These are all issues that you will find at tomap.com, and they'll help you to build out a Christian worldview and to flourish. I hope you learn a lot from the podcast, but you can go beyond the podcast to the courses that we offer at Tome. So I hope you'll take a look at them and sign up. To get access to more than 100 Tome courses, use the code IDEAS. And for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all kinds of courses on a wide variety of subjects. Individuals with expertise, with experience in subjects that will be meaningful to you. So use the code IDEAS and for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all of them. Go to tomap.com. Back to the podcast. So I started to investigate and, and I, I have a bit of a, a, a fondness for research myself. I'm not in the same caliber as you, obviously, Larry. I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of you in terms of your capability and what you've done. Uh, and I will pay tribute at this point to a video that you put out that I put on my channel. And although I was aware of a lot of things of, of the WEF, it still impacted me very, very deeply. And that's why I reached out to you. And that's how we ended up discussing these things because it was a very powerful video and that was to do with what is the world economic forum in fact i sent that to people and instantly they were red pilled what i mean by that is they woke up to what really is going on there You're so it was kind, at that Jim. point i appreciate that no no not at all my pleasure larry and i think at the end of the day um what what's happened is that people are starting to see that there is something a little bit more sinister. So the, the, in the UK, for example, we have one of the oldest parliaments, the, the mother of all parliaments, as it's sometimes known as. Um, 
very ancient traditions in Parliament, uh, parties that are very successful. The Conservative Party in the UK is probably one of the most successful parties uh, that, that has ever existed. Uh, they've won more elections. They've been in power longer than anybody else. And I have to say, you know, I am a traditional conservative. So my political leanings are slightly to the right of centre. I believe in traditional family values, uh, strong borders, strong military peace through strength, uh, supporting our police and law and order, all those types of traditional Isn't types of Isn't that sad that's considered thoughts. to be right of centre? <laughs> <laughs> well, that actually, just be it's, it's strange. <laughs> it, it should be. Uh, but, but, you know, what, what we've seen, um, we've seen uh, a bit of a takeover within our parliament. And it's not just in one particular party. It's happened between the two main parties. So the official opposition being the Labour Party in the United Kingdom, and the Conservative Party. And they've almost become uh, a uniparty where, where they've been, they've almost morphed into the same thing. Now, the founder of the Labour Party was a chap, a fellow Scot actually, was a chap called Sir Keir Hardy, who started the movement in Glasgow many years ago. And it was done because he wanted to protect workers, workers' rights, look after people, because at that period of time, they were abused by abusive uh, employers and health and safety was a big issue. Many people lost their lives at working in factories where there was no fire exits. Or if the fire exits were there, they were sometimes chained and padlocked and, and people lost their lives. So there was some good good reasons why he started what he did. But what's happened, Laurie, in, in the UK is that the Conservative Party, who used to be into these traditional types of values, are no longer interested. Immigration is at an all-time high. We have... Um, very woke ideology going on. We see police officers in rainbow uniforms walking around. Uh, we see police cars covered in rainbow flags and, and painted with rainbow colours. It's become almost a complete and utter joke. Crime is at an all-time high. And because of the immigration situation that's out of control across the, that's coming across the English Channel, um, we have hotels filled with people. We don't know their backgrounds. Many of them are terrorists, as has been confirmed by our security services, known as MI5, who protect our, our internal security within the country. And when Rishi Sunak came into power, he was installed there after a bit of a coup with the previous um, Prime Minister Liz Truss, who was democratically elected by the Conservative members. And she only lasted a matter of weeks. And then Rishi Sunak came out from nowhere and didn't get the members didn't get to vote. And of course, he's a WEF, a World Economic Forum member, as is the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, as is Penny Mordaunt, one of his closest confidants and in his cabinet. And the list goes on and on. So we had an interview with Keir Starmer, or at least somebody, not, not me personally, but somebody had an interview with him and they asked him the question, Davos or Westminster? And he instantly chose Davos. And she asked him why. He said, well, because that's where the real power is. That's where I want to be. And it was quite clear that uh, Sir Keir Starmer, who heads up the, the official opposition, is also a World Economic Forum member. Um, we've seen the introduction of 15-minute cities into the UK. And I know we're not alone there, Larry. We, 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 it's happening in other parts of the world. Um, these, are, these are control mechanisms to stop people from moving out of their districts. And that's actually what they're calling them, districts. And I don't know if you've ever seen a film called The Hunger Games, but that's what they called it. And it's a dystopian type of futuristic nightmare scenario where people have no freedom. And me being Scottish, in particular Scottish Highlander, the, the term freedom is really quite important. And I know it is to many millions of people around the world. So it's not just happening in the UK. There are things that are happening that are impacting on us. The introduction of central bank digital currencies is another mechanism. And in London, we've had what's called the EULEZ, or that's U-L-E-Z, which is a way to tax people. As soon as their car comes out of their driveway, there are special cameras that watch, and they start getting charged a lot of money for using their vehicles until they drive back into their driveway again. So there's this dystopian-type control that's coming in, and it's, it's going back to the World Economic Forum. And you're quite correct. They have no legislative power whatsoever. They're not elected, and German Chairman Klaus Schwab is the only chairman of the organisation which he founded 
I think back in the early 70s, 71, something along those lines. But what they do have is people in very senior positions of power, not just in the United Kingdom, but Joe Biden is linked into it. John Kerry, who is the special envoy for climate change, is linked into it. Justin Trudeau in Canada is a WEF member, as is his deputy, Christia Freeland. And she's actually a board member of the World Economic Forum, which means that she's got significant influence and is very close to her German chairman, Klaus Schwab, as well. And then she's also in charge of a lot of the finance. And I've been speaking to a number of people in Canada very recently, um, and there's a lot of question marks about where the money is being, getting spent in Canada. And unfortunately, they've not been getting too many answers about that. Just um, Emmanuel Macron in France is also a member of the World Economic Forum, as is uh, Mark Rutte, who is New president was, of Bra Brazil. Uh, yes, in Brazil as well. And, and Mark Rutte in Holland. And of course, that's another big issue for me because of what we've seen with the Dutch farmers there, Larry. And um, it's very worrying to, to see that because there are uh, legislation that's coming out that's affecting nitrogen levels. They are um, targeting farmers, not just in Holland, but around the world. And I'm going to come on to something shortly that's going to impact into the United States as well, which is deeply concerning. But in Holland, um, they have expropriated 3,000 farms, which, which means that they are forcibly buying those farms at a price that they want to pay. So they're seizing people's farms in Holland, 3,000 of them to start with, which is going to uh, impact them in, in significant ways. Those farmers have farmed on their, their, they own the land, they own those farms, they own the livestock, and they've got no choice in this. And in fact, the European Union, uh, in particular, the European Commission, which are unelected bureaucrats that run the European Union, have told those farmers that if they resist, they will be banned from farming anywhere else within the European Union member states. So anywhere in, in Europe at all, France, Belgium, Holland, Norway, Sweden, wh wherever, although Norway is not technically a member. But these are, these are very worrying times, Larry, and it's going to come to the United States. And I've been fortunate enough to talk to ranchers and farmers over there on a regular basis. Um, I, I've been speaking to people internationally now in uh, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the United States, France, parts of Europe, Holland, and of course the United Kingdom. And uh, it's incredible what I've been finding out. Uh, but well, before but John we, get, before has we said, get to that, Jim, yeah, let, me, sure. let me ask a quick question. I, I want to come to that, but let me back you up just a little bit. Help people understand. I mean, you're a farmer, so you know a little yeah. bit about this, uh, uh, more than you know the average individual who, who doesn't do any farming. Why are they doing this to these Dutch farmers? Help people to understand what is the motive here in buying up these 3,000 farms and pushing these people out of their homes. What's going on with this? Well, the reason that they're taking over these farms, and you have to bear in mind that Holland is the second largest producer of food and food products in the whole of Europe. It's a massive industry. It's a tiny little country. They only have a population of 5.8 million people. Uh, it's not much bigger than Scotland, to be honest. We've got a population of about 5 million. And Holland, but Holland is one of these incredibly industrious little countries. They have farming methods that are a shining example to other farmers all around the world. It doesn't get better than the, the Holland farmers. You know, the Dutch farmers are incredibly good at what they do. And it doesn't make sense that they're being targeted in this way. And I had a very good interview with Anita van der Molen, who works with a lot of farmers. And she she's uh, her business is, deals with cattle and, and the transportation of cattle. And she was explaining to me that Holland is completely self-sufficient in terms of food provision. In fact, they are providing food for many, many other nations. But the World Economic Forum doesn't want countries to be independent and prosperous because at the whole, at the heart of the, the soul, the dark soul of the World Economic Forum is a desire for a one world government, a new world order that they control. And what they fear 
are the masses of people that are around. Because if people wake up to what they're really doing, then they could end up being in a big problem because there's a lot of us and there's only a few thousand of them that own all the land and all the wealth and all the money. So one way of, of ensuring that they have control is to control the food. And they are looking right now at setting up what they're calling food hubs. And these food hubs will be controlled by them. So going back to Holland briefly, they're going to stop them being independent in terms of the production of food and crops and cattle and milk and dairy. And they're going to make them dependent on other nations. And what they're doing is they're launching uh, a media uh, tirade against farmers. They're trying to portray farmers as being a problem for climate change. They're blaming herds of cows for, for warming up the planet. Yeah, through cattle methane. flatulence. Cattle flatulence, yeah. And, and it's just not true. This, it's false science. They're using this climate scam type language to frighten people, gullible people that don't understand that farming is the solution. It's certainly not the problem. And the, the real reason is control, Larry. They want to control the masses of people. And there's a very dark, um, there's a dark agenda. And you've covered this very well in your podcasts. And unfortunately, there's no nice way of saying it, but there is truly a depopulation agenda going on. And um, we can talk a little bit more about that. I uncovered a doctor in Canada. I, I just retweeted about it. Y you know, it, it's going viral as we speak. I think it's probably close to, if not exceed, excel, exceeded the 1 million mark. And it was only posted yesterday afternoon. I've been mm -hmm. very fortunate with my followers on my channel. And I've had a number of videos that have gone well, well into the millions of views because I'm, I'm, I'm picking subjects and I'm engaging with people like yourself who stick to the facts. They are not, uh, they're not blowing things out of proportion. They're dealing with the truth. And I, I didn't speak to this doctor, but he's followed me back on Twitter. I think there's a, probably a very good chance that I'm going to be speaking to him quite soon. And what he's, what he's exposed to do with the vaccines is just mind boggling and very, very concerning. Uh, and if you want me to, I can expand on that a bit more, but well, if you want to tell me to a answer, little bit. Uh, Tell me a little bit more now, Jim. Let's let's go back to where you were just a few minutes ago. Now having a little bit of an understanding of why the World Economic Forum is buying up these farms and mm. um, you know dislocating all these farmers. You were starting to tell us um, about your engagement with farmers in other parts of the world, in yeah. South America, in the United States, and so on. What what are you discovering from those conversations? Well, they're all being targeted. Uh, this isn't where, you know, the, the farmers in, in Canada, the farmers in Holland, the farmers in the UK are not alone. It's it's happening slightly at different rates. For example, in Holland, they're really getting it hard at the moment, but it's going to come. And I've been engaging with uh, some ranchers in, in, in Nebraska and uh, some farmers over in, in Texas and various other places, and they're starting to wake up to what's going on. I, I spent a long time talking to a farmer um, in, in Yorkshire uh, last night, uh, yesterday morning, and then again last night in detail about what was coming to the UK. And, and it's very concerning. So they're, they're, what they're looking to do, for example, the Environmental Protection Agency in America are getting massive investments at the moment, huge amounts of money. And they are hiring all these people, these enforcers, on massive salaries huge salaries in, in excess of $200,000 a year. I mean, very well paid jobs. And they're going, they're, they're, they're just recruiting an army of people. And what they're going to do in the Environment, Environmental Protection Agency, they're going to be going and paying visits to farmers and ranchers and different people armed with new legislation that's going to be coming in, which will be passed by into law by legislators and lawmakers in the Senate and Congress, which of course will be drip fed down from people like John Kerry, who is fully involved with the World Economic Forum. And he has stated, in fact, that the seizing of farms may have to be done in the United States. I think he mentioned a date of 24 or 25. So we're not talking far into the future. This is happening right now. And people need to understand that it's all about control. Control the food and you control the people. But what I've been doing is I've been engaging with people internationally because I believe there are three strands. I've been, spent a career working with 
specialist police units, not not as a police officer, but as something else. And um, I ran a, a team in Scotland and I reported to my HQ, which was down in London, and I had a special role down there. And I dealt with all sorts of, of um, things that specialist that I, I worked spe with specialized police officers and doing you know intelligence and, and and serious organized crime and violent crime and all sorts of things like that ran campaigns and what I found working with people like that and it's very similar in the military you have what's called the strategic level the tactical level and the operational level and I had an idea sitting just quietly one one evening a few months ago thinking about all this things that, about the World Economic Forum, what was going on. And Larry, I truly perceive them to be a global threat to humanity itself, to all freedom-loving people around the world, people that love their constitution, their Bill of Rights in America, people that just want to be lives. These people are a very real threat. And so I thought we maybe need to counter this global threat with a global response, because any individual country is not going to be able to stand against them alone. These people are incredibly well financed. They've got people like Bill Gates, George Soros, Alex Soros, George's son, of course, has now taken over the realm, uh, the reins there, and there are many others. And I think what we need to do is to try and uh, create a greater awareness, just with ordinary people around the world, so that they understand what's happening. And hopefully, there will be some good guys out there because. Not every billionaire is is evil or wants to take over the world. Be good people out there, and in a in a strange way, I would pay tribute to the likes of Elon Musk, who is probably the the wealthiest billionaire of them all. And if it wasn't for him, I can tell you now, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now on Twitter, talking to you or talking to any other people. Um, I know that, I know that I'm on a, going to be on your YouTube channel, but but most of my work is done on Twitter. If it wasn't for Elon Musk buying Twitter and opening it all up to, to true freedom of speech again, this wouldn't be happening. So not everybody that's wealthy or uh, has been successful in life and business or whatever is bad. And I kind of hope that we might draw people like that into the, the mix and maybe help to fund the resistance that I believe is needed against these truly wicked and evil people uh, and you're quite correct, Klaus Schwab is only but one of them. There are probably far, far more senior people to him that are probably far worse. But of course, he's the sort of main figurehead, isn't he? Um, so that's where I'm at on the international circuit at the moment. But we're making huge, huge progress, Larry. Jim, have you engaged any, you know, they call themselves, if you go to the World Economic Forum, they don't say the World Economic Forum or the WEF, they say WEF. Have you engaged with any weffers? Have you actually met any of these people? Um, I've engaged with billionaires and many millionaires, and, uh, just simply because of the work I've done and the, I've I've had um, political contact with with people, very wealthy people. But whether they were weffers or not, I I wouldn't know, and they certainly well, uh, back back I, then I I didn't ask. I'm not using it as a test of the, uh, you know, the authenticity of your work. As you well know, I, I'm in agreement with you. I ask because I would encourage you to, because these are, you know, you're talking about how dangerous they are. Hmm. Uh, they are dangerous. And um, all the more so when you actually engage them in conversation. When I was at Davos, I think you know this, but for the sake of our audience, I'll repeat it. When I was there, I was there, you know, you know, kind of as a spy. I mean, as far as they knew, I was just another weffer. And I went and sat in one of the coffee shops and during the, uh, you know, the breaks between various sessions, you know, there, there are these, these, these plenary sessions and then breakout sessions that are all going on and in between, you know, just as you would at any, any corporate conference, um, people pile into restaurants and coffee shops to chat and get a bite to eat, something to drink before they head back into um, to the conference itself. And uh, people thinking that I'm just a weffer like, uh, like one of them, they begin to talk to you quite freely. And issues like we're discussing here on this show about, you know, I, I, I detected the word, and I was actually going to have a little fun with you, and your, the bio you sent to me, you used the word sustainable. <laughs> because in the... Uh, you know where I'm going with this. I, 
I noticed that their word that is freighted with all kinds of evil meaning is the word sustainability or, or variants of it. And whenever you see the word or hear the word sustainable, you need to brace yourself for what's coming next because they're hiding in it uh, I, you know, a lot of sordid stuff. And mm. by way of example, I was doing some years ago, I was doing some research on the, uh, the intellectual origins of the Holocaust. I'd received a, uh, a fellowship that sent me to Europe. And it was very interesting to discover that the, um, the American and British interrogators at Nuremberg of those Nazis who carried out the Holocaust that in the very early going of those interrogations, they um, kept encountering the phrase, uh, final solution. Mm -hmm. And we know well enough what that means now, you know, um, you know, so many decades hence. But at the time, the West was unfamiliar with the term. And you have one of the, one of the prosecutors having to say, excuse me, what is what do you mean by final solution? And they came to realize that the Germans had even hidden from themselves the evil that they were doing by altering language. They didn't use words like uh, genocide. They uh, they didn't mm -hmm. speak in terms of mass killing. Instead, they they cloaked it uh, with phrases like you know the Jewish question and the final mm. solution. And I've discovered that this is the case with the World Ex Economic Forum with terms like for the greater good um, and uh, sustainability mm -hmm. and um, you know for the good of the planet, this kind mm. of thing. And when you begin to engage them in conversation, they, this, this is the kind of language they begin to use. And if you're, mm. if you're not sort of acclimated to it, you, it might escape you what it is that they're actually talking about. And then yeah. when you realize that they say something like um, population sustainability, you, what they're actually talking about is, as you well know, they're, they're talking about depopulation. They're talking about yeah. reducing the global population. As I've pointed out in more than one of uh, my podcasts, Dr. Dennis Meadows, uh, MIT, PhD, uh, World Economic Forum Agenda Contributor. That's his title, World mm -hmm. Economic Forum Agenda Contributor. So this is a guy who contributes mm -hmm. to the agenda, yeah. the evil agenda of the World Economic Forum. And you have him in, in interviews saying, yeah, mm -hmm. gosh, it's, you know, it's unfortunate that we have you know, almost 8 billion people on the planet and you know, we got to find a way to get that back down under 2 billion. The, 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 the earth can sustain you know, 1 billion, may, maybe 2 billion, but got, we got to find a way to get back down there. And then he says, we need dictatorship. And he says, and I hope we can get there, that is to less than 2 billion people peacefully. Peacefully. Yeah. This is, it's astonishing the way these people talk. I, in fact, maybe, maybe when this call is done, we need to strategize that the two of us should go to the World Economic Forum in <laughs> January of 2024. We we can mm. we can go there as uh, you know as as Sherlock Holmes and Watson. I'll play Watson <laughs> to your uh, to your Sherlock Holmes, and uh, but go there and uh, see if we can't get in a little trouble. But honestly, just sitting in conversation with them is mm. enough because. Mm. I, I keep referring to this quotation by C.S. Lewis just simply because it's so good. But C.S. Lewis said, the very worst kind of tyranny is that tyranny which is exercised for your own good. And it is because the tyrant does what he does. He tyrannizes you with a clear conscience. He is sure that what he is doing is actually good. And, you know, as I reflect on history, there are those figures in history who are evil and, and they know it. I, I have to mm -hmm. believe Genghis Khan was full well, f uh, full, fully aware that he was a rather wicked individual. Um, you know, Ivan the Terrible, Stalin, figures of this type. But there are those individuals who really believed mm -hmm. that what they did was for the greater good. Hitler believed it. He yeah. was such a figure. And these are, these are those kinds of individuals because they are sure that ushering in these policies that are anti-human, and I've made the mm -hmm. argument that 
that this is just a logical outworking of an utterly godless worldview. When you mm. take atheism to its mm. logical conclusions, and I've had people say in YouTube and Twitter in the comments, ah, Larry, you know, I'm an atheist. I don't believe any of this stuff. Not my point to condemn all atheists. Not my point at all. What I'm saying is when you take that worldview to its logical conclusion that there is no God to judge you mm -hmm. in the next life for your actions in this one, that human life has no more value, no intrinsic value whatsoever, and no more value than any other animal on the face of the earth, then you are, you are likely to conclude that might makes right and that selfishness yeah. actually is a logical thing mm -hmm. to do. And this is where these people are. It's a, it's a post-God world that has arrived at a place that says human beings matter less than policy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And these people have no conscience because of that, because they don't believe they're going to answer to any higher power. But I mentioned a doctor in Canada, and I think I should just 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 maybe touch on this because it, I believe it is connected to what the World Economic Forum have done with the de depopulation agenda. Dr. Shoemaker, um, he's in Toronto in Canada, and he, he put out a video. And essentially what he is saying is that normally there is only one person in a million that gets myocarditis. Myocarditis is basically, and I'm not a doctor, but 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 it's basically inflammation of the heart. It dam damages the heart. And he said that he's done studies with the cardiograms and all sorts of different ways of, of telling that out of the people who have been vaccinated, instead of it being one in a million, it's 200,000 in a million who are now coming down with myocarditis. And it gets worse because he said that there is a 20% and he's, and he's, once again, he's basing this on data, you know, scientific data, medical data, 20% of people are getting this. So that equates to 20 in a hundred, uh, 2000 in a hundred thousand and 200,000 in a million. And what he's then saying is that 50% of the people affected. So if it's 200,000, you're talking about a hundred thousand people will die within five years. And he said, that's so a medical it's fact. absolutely astonishing. You know, I, I will reveal something of my own view, which maybe I uh, will feel to you like no view at all. I, I'm yet undecided as to what I think about the conversations on the vaccines. And it's simply because I confess I haven't really done a deep dive on this. I have friends who are very conservative uh, individuals and who are highly suspicious of the World Economic Forum who sit on both sides of this, individuals whom I respect. But I will say this, what I find is highly suspicious <laughs> is that how is it that the vaccine is being pushed, and it was pushed hugely by mm. Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum, by Bill Gates, and these are individuals who are depopulation people. Yeah. I mean, they are all about depopulation. Mm -hmm. It feels to me, and they're the pro-lockdown and, and so on, doesn't it seem just a little bit odd that the people that we were told to trust concerning the vaccines are mm -hmm. the very people who are the most anti-human? Yes, absolutely. And the shocking thing I mean, is... If you, if you believe nothing else, that at least should, should raise some alarm bells. Oh, oh definitely. Definitely. And I actually did some research into how many people got vaccinated in the UK. And it was in the, the 90s for one, it was slightly less for two, and for three, it was 70.2% of the population that were over 12 and up to the age range that I, I documented. And I worked so, out according... So 10% of the vaccine the vaccinated population, according to Dr. Shoemaker, is that what you said? So, so what he is basically... So basically, he's saying that for every... A uh, million people, uh, 200,000 will we'll get myocarditis. myocarditis. And 100,000, so 50% of them, will die within five years. And in the UK, we have a population of 67 million. And I worked it out according to the 70.2 data percentage. You're talking 24 million people. But it's not starting from this point, Larry. The vaccination started three years ago. And it takes five years, according to Dr. Shoemaker, for people to die. So within the next two years, we might see 24 million people in the United Kingdom die. 
Yeah, this is uh, this is astonishing, astonishing stuff. And I, I want to be clear as to what we're saying on this podcast. Neither Jim nor I are making this prediction. We are saying that this is what someone else says. Their yes. own research and data right. says neither of us, um, you know, claim to be scientists no, we don't or no. are knowledgeable on this. Just simply that there are those who do believe that this is the case. Um, thinking about the World Economic Forum, um, what is happening uh, in the UK and uh, what is happening in, uh, uh, in continental Europe and then certainly what's happening globally, what are you, what are you personally doing? There are a lot of people who are going to be listening to us, Jim, and go, this is all very interesting and alarming. It's disturbing, but what can I do? Mm. And yet here you are, you know, a, you know, a businessman in, uh, in Scotland, and you've become quite engaged on this issue. So tell us a little of your own personal story to how you decided you were going to do something about this and begin pushing back on it. Yeah, it's one of those strange ones, Larry. I, I didn't, you know, when I, just to give it, put it into context, when I, when I stopped or finished the, the campaign with the Brexit party back in 2019, I had fought an incredibly hard campaign. I had been recruited deeply within the Brexit party. I wasn't just a parliamentary candidate. I became a recruiter within the party. I spent a long time in London recruiting other parliamentary candidates, vetting them, interviewing them, using my, my skills that I'd done over the period of time, many years before that, to good effect. So when I came out, I, I was quite happy just to, you know, take a break, get stuck into to, doing some farming work and, and just just chilling. And about sort of uh, seven or eight months ago, um, I, I was walking across a field, you know, and uh, I was on my own. And I just I just thought I, I really need to get back onto Twitter. It was just one of these strange things that just popped into my mind. And I did. And I started to talk about vaccine harms and vaccine injuries. And all of a sudden, um, my my followers started to go shooting up. I mean, I only had about 1,500 or 2,000. I never, never used Twitter before. Uh, May 2019 was when I first started doing it because I was campaigning. I was told, you know, you want to use social media, Jim, if you you know you want to do it, get get going with it. So I did. I was never really that bothered about it before. And I also was aware that people were getting uh, nuked on Twitter by people before Elon Musk took it over. If you had to watch what you said. So I thought, well, Elon Musk is now taking it over. He says it's a free platform. Let's try it. And it was. And all of a sudden, my membership started to grow. And um, it's strange. I, I never really set out to do anything. I just felt compelled to do it. And I ended up having conversations with people, looking at it. And I, a, bit, a bit like Christine Anderson, who is a member of the European Parliament with the German AFD party. She's a great lady. And she got interviewed recently. Why did you go into politics? And she said, because I was afraid. I was afraid of what the World Economic Forum were doing. I'm afraid of what the globalists are doing. I needed to do something. And I'm looking around and I'm seeing the devastation caused by the lockdowns, the forced mandated vaccinations, appalling treatment of people in Canada being beaten by, by mounted police officers and trampled by horses. Same thing in, in Australia. I just felt I had to do something. And, uh, and I'm on a journey. And I'm on a journey now with tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of people reaching tens and tens and tens of millions of people. Do you know, I've just been followed by General Flynn who's the right-hand man of President Trump. Kim.com. Um, who else is it? Um, there's so many people with massive accounts that are paying attention to what I'm saying. And I'm only really a very ordinary person with a fairly small channel. But yesterday I found out that somebody on Twitter called, and I apologise for the name, but he calls himself Cat Turd. And he's quite well known. Uh, he's got 1.8 million, almost 2 million followers followed me. He retweeted something that I put out that went viral again. I, I, I think I've had something like 10 or 12 posts that have all gone viral within the last few weeks. It's just <laughs> unbelievable. And it's not that I'm anything special, but I'll tell you what is special is the people that are following my channel. And Cat Turd went and retweeted something I put out about Ghislaine Maxwell and the Epsteins. And of course, you know, when you've got big, big channels like that, I mean, I was very deeply honoured that General Flynn spoke the way he did about me. He actually said, you're, you're a stand-up guy, you're taking on the World Economic Forum, and I you know, can't remember exactly what he said, but he put it out in a tweet. Amazing. 
that, that people like, like that would be noticing what I'm doing. But it's because of the followers that I have on my channel, but not just them, the people that are, that are watching it. They're sharing the content. They're getting the message out in significant ways. So it's them that are making it possible for me to reach a global international audience. It's not that there's anything particularly special about me. And yes, I'm a businessman, but I'm not doing it for business reasons. I'm doing Jim, it because uh, I care. <laughs> Jim, by we've not met personally, but by any chance, are you... Oh, about six foot seven with long auburn hair, uh, maybe from the Scottish Highlands. Do you know who I'm describing? Well, Do you know who I'm describing? Uh, well, you talk about William Wallace, Benny. Chance. Yes, I am talking about William Wallace. <laughs> I am uh, talking about William Wallace. He, he was he was not the size of Mel Gibson. He was six seven. <laughs> yeah, six seven. Guy. I have I have looked at yeah. that um, Claymore broadsword yeah. um of his which you're, you're not carrying that thing around on your back are you jim uh, uh, no i'm not i'm i'm a six i'm six one i'm six foot one i'm pushing six foot two when i've got my cowboy boots on well <laughs> you know I do, I, what i, I don't do want to see jim is you strapped on a table you know shouting <laughs> freedom you freedom. know as uh yeah. as they remove your entrails uh, the, uh, i'd rather not no yeah so let's let's hope it doesn't end that way but no mm -hmm. honestly jim this is i i i somewhat jokingly make reference to um to william wallace uh, but not wholly because you know that was a populist movement mm -hmm. that was an early mm -hmm. that was an early populist effort to push back at elitists and to say no we won't be pushed around and um we uh we demand to be left alone we demand our freedoms and you know the, the point is this is an ancient battle this is an ancient battle between um the elitists, and I don't want mm -hmm. to call them elites. That's a compliment to them. They are the elitists. They think they are better than you. Yeah. And, um, you know, in populace, grassroots, ordinary people, and that battle continues on to our own day, though the manner in which the battle is being fought is is somewhat different. Uh, if those took place at Falkirk oh. and... And Sterling Bridge today is being fought on Twitter. It's being fought on Instagram. Yes. It's being fought mm -hmm. on the uh, on on the battlefield of ideas, and we mm -hmm. have to engage in that realm. And I got to tell you, Jim, just at a personal level, it's been an encouragement to me that you reach out to me. Um, it's an encouragement to me to know that uh, you know there there each additional anti weffer anti globalist every thoughtful populist you know that i meet that's another brother in arms that is an encouragement to me and uh meeting them around the world guys like you it's an encouragement to me to know the guys like you are out there well i mean one thing i would say um it's funny you mentioned william wallace you know and, and i don't see myself as anything like that but i'll tell you this uh, i'm a scottish highlander and my family go back many 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 generations and we were very warlike you know, when we weren't fighting the English, we were fighting each other. You know, that the, the Scots are, are renowned, renowned for it. But I'm also part Viking on my mother's side. So it gets even worse. You know, I'm part Viking uh, from the Norwegian Vikings that, that came in and settled up in uh, Shetland and Stornoway and, and, and worked their way around the west coast of Scotland. Not far from where Donald Trump's mother was born, actually. So, mm. you know, um, I, I, I just think that collectively when people wake up, to the power that's in them, that lies within them, that's when you're going to see an unstoppable movement take place. People are afraid. They think the governments have all this total control. And what they fear the most, Barry, is the people waking up to the real truth of what their real destiny is and their real purpose and the power that lies within them. Because once that happens, nothing will stop what's coming you know thinking about um we've we don't we've got about 10 minutes left or so but i think americans would be very interested to know what the opinions are of you know what's going on in the united states well how are how are people in the uk reacting to to the events that are that are that sort of seems like the constant flow of negativity the things that are happening in our streets that are happening in our government mm. are um are, are people in the UK looking at that and going, oh, well, it's really, really wonderful that we have a, a guy of such character like Joe Biden who is putting down these 
insurrectionists or do they see no. and sense that something something sinister mm. is happening in this country yeah yeah they, they definitely do you know i love america i love americans uh, I, i'm a big interest in america i love the, the sort of the the early rock culture uh, back in the 50s and the 60s you know loved all of that um, and uh, you know have a deep respect for the 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 flag of America, you know, it's not my flag. I'm not. I'm a Brit. You know, I I I'm proud of my own flag, and I'm proud of my the St Andrew's Cross, my Scottish flag. But yeah, we see the fentanyl abuse. We see what's going on in the southern border uh, of the United States. We see the mass uncontrolled immigration, which is a tool of the globalists to bring down nation states and weaken them from within. Joe Biden is sold into that. He's sold America out. Um, he's despised in this country. I'll tell you that right now. And Donald Trump is seen as the true uh, person who, who who could get things back going again. There's many of us that, that believe that something pretty nefarious went on there at the last election. And, and it's a sad, sad situation when you see people um, in, in, in streets that are mainly Democrat-run uh, cities in, in, in stupor. They're dragged out. They don't even know where they are. It's a tragedy, an absolute tragedy what's going on. And yet... They are pumping billions more dollars of taxpayers' money into this ridiculous war in Ukraine, which which I think is just scandalous. As General Flynn said just quite recently, that child sex trafficking, narcotics trafficking, weapons uh, trafficking, it's all going on in Ukraine. The money laundering that's taking place there is off the charts. And we everybody knows that Joe Biden and his son Hunter are little more than criminals. They are fakes and they're frauds. And of course, the vaccine injuries potentially that Dr. Shoemaker in Canada was talking about is now affecting those military personnel in America and also in Canada, as I reported today. Um, they've got a commander in chief that's that's not loyal to the, the, the military there. And no, uh, many of them are turning their back on him. Absolutely. And uh, I have a bit of a theory and I offer no evidence for this. So I want to be upfront in, in saying this. We need an intrepid journalist who will track this down. But I, I am confident that if you could follow the money from the United States, the billions that are being sent there, it is being, it's not only going to nefarious criminal causes and, you know, into, into Swiss bank accounts or you know, somewhere in the Cayman Islands for the, uh, for the Bidens and for the Clintons and the Obamas and various others. But I'm convinced it's being used to fund various, um, uh, World Economic Forum causes. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. I think, I think the, I think it's coming out, and I think there is more and more and more information. The stay in power in America is is anyone's guess, but the deep state are are protecting him. The the mainstream media are obviously protecting him and have been since he, he even before he got in. The whole Hunter laptop thing that the you know Director Ray and the FBI, uh, it, it the whole thing is is corrupt, and you know. There's an old saying, and Larry, you'll know where this comes from, that, that, and I'm paraphrasing slightly here, so apologies if I don't quote it exactly the way it should be, but there's a saying that goes, um, a house divided against itself shall not stand. And it's a biblical saying, it's a very true saying, and unfortunately America is very polarised uh, for all sorts of different reasons, and that, that worries me because where, where sometimes America gets criticised and sometimes that criticism is warranted, but they've also done a lot of good in the world. Incredibly generous people in america they have supported uh, charities and good causes all around the world and if america ever falls britain and israel and canada and australia and new zealand won't be far behind and that's the sad no, the, reality uh, the, if, if the american ship sinks the 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 undertow will be such to pull down many smaller boats with it there's there's yeah. no question about that and i and i say in my book around the world in more than 80 days that america's influence depending on who is in office in the last, oh, 40 years, is very Jekyll and Hyde. Um, you have such wonderful policies as, you know, the Marshall Plan, uh, the rebuilding of post-war Europe, um, which yeah. is an astonishing post-war uh, recovery effort that is unparalleled in history. But you also see under the Clintons, under the Obamas, uh, under Obama and under, uh, under Biden, uh, the policies in Africa and in South America pushing uh, homosexuality, uh, pushing the LGBTQ, um, you know, agenda. 
and uh, the pushing of abortion um, in those countries under the guise of, you know, of women's rights, human rights, things of that nature. You know, I think some people here would be a little bit surprised to to learn that the kind of things that we're seeing taking place here with the what I call the alphabet mafia, you're seeing it in the UK too, aren't you? No, oh, absolutely, Larry. I mean, it's happening. It's like we're being run by a criminal syndicate. You know, just just I know that we're approaching the end of the podcast, but I must tell you this. I mean, Richie Sunicate emerged. He he when he was talking about the safe and effective vaccines, it turned out that he had actually invested five hundred million dollars. He's a very wealthy guy. Five hundred million dollars in an offshore account through a company called Thelema Partners in a notorious tax haven called the Cayman Islands into a company called Moderna, which is one of the big pharma companies that produced the vaccine. And, you know, why would you do that? If you've got nothing to hide, why would you put that into an offshore account in a a notorious tax haven? I'm not saying he is doing anything wrong because I don't know, but it's a bit interesting, isn't it? I sometimes wonder if, if we're really truly being run by, by anybody that's honest in, in politics anymore. I think you've got some decent congressmen and women and some senators over in America, but there's very few members of parliament that I have any respect for. And, um, you know, I think there are good people in this country that would make excellent members of parliament. They're honest, they're decent people. But when you're up against the World Economic Forum and their massive... Uh, control mechanisms, you wonder uh, what it's going to take to break through there. But I believe that the people will, when they wake up and they realise the power that's within them, uh, they can effect decent change. And I think, you know, when all is said and done, we are winning the narrative war. You're quite correct to say it's no longer on the, the battlefields. It used to be in the days of William Wallace. But we are fighting a war that's every bit as as intense in so many ways. But I think we're winning with people like yourself, my channel and others, collectively, we are making an impact. And I think waking people up is the key to the future and the prosperity and the peace that will come when these people are sidelined again and put back down to where they need to go. Um, Because we don't and can't live in a world where there are evil, wicked people like that in charge. Because humanity itself is at stake here, I believe. Yeah, I was gonna say, the stakes are much, much higher now than they were um, in the uh, the Scottish rebellions. We're we're now in a global battle, and I will say this: you know, to your point about people waking up, I uh, I have done an awful lot of travel over the course of my uh, career, but particularly just since just since the pandemic began, I've probably been in I don't know maybe fifteen or or more countries just in the last few years. And one of the things that I was noticing is is this kind of a populist um, uprising that is happening all over the world. And it is happening in South America, like uh, countries like, say, Colombia uh, and, uh, and Brazil. It's happening in Germany uh, with the anti-vaxxers, you know, there, mm-hmm. the, the, the whole Nuremberg uh, movement there. Uh, it's happening in France. It is happening in the yeah. Netherlands. Less so, it seems to me, in the UK, though you can correct me if I'm wrong. Certainly in the United States, the Freedom Convoy in Canada. Mm. The point Mm. being, I think that people around the world are sensing that something very sinister is happening around the world and that it is all being orchestrated by a central body, um, being like the, the World Economic Forum, which is, again, to use my Bond villain analogy, it's like a specter you know, sort of organization, and they are trying to resist. But they need direction. They need clarity of, of purpose. Right now, they don't have it. And the, uh, the globalists are extremely um, well-organized and they're extremely well-funded. But I, like you, believe that if we can mobilize, we can inform, if we can equip, if we can encourage our side, um, we can mobilize them. And, uh, and I think that will make a huge, huge difference for freedom not just in my country or your, yours, but around the world. Yeah, definitely. And I would agree with that. I think in the UK, we're a little bit more laid back. We're a little bit more sort of, uh, you know, sort of, yeah, sort of standoffish, I guess, is a way to describe it. But when the Brits get going, my goodness, watch out, you know. That, that British bulldog spirit is alive and well. And you remember that the, the UK is made up of, of, of different nations. You know, we've got the Scots, we've got the Welsh, we've got the Northern Irish, and we've got the English. 
And when all is said and done, we came together to defeat a very wicked and evil power under uh, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. And it was difficult, but we came together and we did it back then. And I see what's rising now as something very similar to it, except that it's no longer confined to a particular country being Germany. This is now truly global. And that's why I maintain that we need a global effort to defeat it this time around. But thanks to people like you, and thanks to people like the followers that we respectively have in our channels, we're getting the word out, waking people up. And then, it's, as you say, it's about mobilizing and getting people together. When they realize they've got the power, that's when things really start to happen in a positive way, in a good way. Well, Jim, it's been a pleasure to have you on the Ideas Have Consequences podcast. What I want you to do is I want you to go to Sterling, a place where you've been to before, and I want you to go up on Abbey Craig. Uh, you, know, you know where I'm talking about, right? Uh, yeah, to the yeah, Wallace to the Wallace Memorial, the Wallace Monument. And I want yeah. you to get a picture of yourself standing there holding the William Wallace uh, Claymore. And uh, that means <laughs> that we need to put that on the anti-WEF flag. Um, that is uh, that is what we need. We need, a, we need that good photo. I, I want to see that on your, your Twitter feed. Larry, I will do that for you. I'm planning to go down, <laughs> I will. I'm planning to do that. I'm going down to have a meeting with some people down there uh, in that neck of the woods. And uh, the only thing, I might I might have difficulty carrying a, a six foot claimer sword around. <laughs> if the police officers see me, that might be a problem. But I, I promise you, I'll get a photograph down at the Wallace Monument. At least I'll do I that. I can't wait you. to see it. I am gonna, I'm gonna hold you to that now. I'm gonna be, <laughs> I'm gonna be looking for it. And, uh, and I look, look, look forward to posting it and reposting it again and again. In the meantime, Jim, um, Stay calm and carry on. Thank you, Larry. It's been an absolute pleasure to you and to your audience. It's always good to talk to you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much.